Hi, I'm Dr. Caroline Leaf, and welcome to my podcast, Cleaning Up Your Mental Mess. Well, as you can see, we have a cute little Shih Tzu puppy. This is our new addition to our family, joining us for a few minutes today just to talk about how to de-escalate stress. Well, let me tell you that this little Shih Tzu puppy and his little girlfriend, Nala, are one of my favorite tips. And I'm going to tell you how just touching a pet, what it does in the brain. And I'm going to give you five other tips that I use that are fantastic for de-escalating high emotional states. So let's get going. But first of all, he will bark too much. So I'm just going to have to hand him over. Bye, everyone. Okay, so back to this podcast. But just before we begin, I just want to remind you that this podcast is for educational purposes and is not medical advice. Right, well, as you saw, holding that puppy, and we all know looking at puppy videos and holding puppies and stroking our pets is just a phenomenal way of de-escalating emotions. So I want to talk about de-escalating emotions and give you six tips that have worked for me incredibly well. Now, we all live a high-stress life, so it's not just me that's living a high-stress life. It is. Our life is busy. And stress is good for us, but we've got to know how to make it work for us. And I know you've heard me say this before, but if you haven't, let me quickly remind you that the stress system, which is controlled by the HPA axis in the brain and the body, is actually there to help us to be very focused and alert and, and tapping into our inner wisdom and being able to do things in an efficient way. But that's if our perception of stress is good. If we see the feelings that we experience when we have stress, when something suddenly challenges us and our heart starts beating and we feel like on edge or we've got something to prepare and we're like on edge, when we feel that that's bad for us, then it will be bad for us. You see, what you actually think with your mind will shift your neurophysiology and then increase and escalate the stress response into the wrong direction. But if you change your perception and you see stress is good for you and you recognize that this beating of your heart, this feeling of, ah, oh, bit of overwhelm, you know, the adrenaline shot, that kind of thing, the tension in your body. If you see that as okay, that is just my body preparing me to get very deeply and intensively focused. When you say that, then your neurophysiology starts to work for you and a whole bunch of neurophysiological reactions around about 1400 will now start working for you and you'll have blood flow and oxygen flowing to your brain, etc. Now, it's great to know this, especially when we are in high emotional states from maybe pressure at work or family pressure or political pressure, life pressure, things that are going on around us politically. It can put us into states of high emotional stress and we need to de-escalate because when we stay in that state and we don't manage it, then it's like the stress is going around and around and it's getting tighter and tighter and eventually it kind of snaps. But if we say, okay, I recognize what this is, I gather awareness that I'm feeling this in my body, that I'm feeling a high level of emotional stress, I need to de-escalate so that I can make the stress work for me and I can stay alert, stay focused, but stay in the right state of mind and that, that my physiology is working for me. You just make some sort of statement like that. So gathering awareness of that, Refle then you immediately move into reflecting, why am I feeling like this? Maybe make a few notes in the two writing steps. And I'm busy describing the neurocycle now, the five steps of the neurocycle. That is the system that I've developed, a scientific system I've developed over 38 years to help you manage your mind. And in this case, we're talking about de-escalating a high emotional state or a high emotional stress state and making stress work for you. So first you gather awareness of your state or your emotional state. What are the emotions? What are the physical reactions? What is your perspective? You reflect a little bit on why you're in that state. You make a few notes. You, two, the third and fourth step are writing steps. The first writing step is to just get everything out on paper. The second step, writing step is to organize it and find the triggers and antidotes. And then the, and to start reconceptualizing it, reconceptualizing, taking the concepts and re-looking at it and seeing it from a different way. And not just adding information in an incremental way, but actually rebuilding, like a, almost like a chemical calculation. So like when you put a teaspoon of sugar in coffee, it dissolves and it changes the coffee. That's reconceptualization versus adding oil to water where they don't mix. So we don't want things, we want to create something new, okay? Seeing it from a different perspective, which includes the components of the past issue, but in a new way. And so the fourth step is to reconceptualize. And then the fifth step is a little act of reach. So... What I'm going to do now tell, is tell you how I applied this in my life last night, actually, and this morning. 
and then I'm going to give you six tips to help you as in its sort of active reach form, that fifth step. Okay, so first thing is I have a deadline, a massive deadline to get a publication finished and it's extremely complicated. And on top of that, I've got my normal work day and I also had to prepare a whole lot of other creative stuff for meetings and whatever. So I had a lot of intense thinking work that I needed a block of time when no one interrupted me. Otherwise, when when you had a normal working day, you start something and then there's an email and there's there's a knock on your office door and then there's this and then there's that constantly disrupting you. When I'm in intense sort of development work, creative work or writing journal articles and things like that, I need to be uninterrupted for hours. And I wasn't finding the space. The deadline was creeping up and I could feel last night when I got into bed, I could feel an emotional intensity. It was building during the day and I could feel this emotional intensity because I'd planned to try and finish it yesterday because the deadline is today and I didn't. So I was feeling this build up. I was feeling and I gathered awareness. I immediately went into a neurocycle. I did a couple of neurocycles and this is what I did. I gathered awareness of the fact that I was feeling very tense about my in my body. I was getting adrenaline rushes. I was tense. I was speaking fast. So I started gathering awareness of my emotional reactions, my warning signals, my physical warning signals, my, my behavioral warning signals, and my perspective. And they all said, I'm overwhelmed. I don't know when I'm going to get this done. It's so difficult. I'm feeling anxiety. I'm feeling frustration. I'm feeling irritation. I'm getting snappy. I'm not focusing. I noticed all of those. Then I reflected, why? I felt I felt like that because I wasn't getting that block of time, which is where I started the story, and I wasn't having an uninterrupted block of time to do this very intense work that I needed an uninterrupted block of time. And I wrote that I wrote those feelings down. I did my recheck, reconceptualize, and I thought, okay, well, let's look at this deadline. Can it shift? Can it change? Can I see it from a different angle? Can I do it this way? Can I do it that way? And I reconceptualized all the problems I had identified in three and four, and then my active reach was to spend. Three hours last night when I was sitting in bed, because I couldn't sleep at that point, it was about 10 o'clock and I worked till one o'clock on my active reach was on what I had planned to do related to that particular article. And I got it done and I went to sleep and I woke up this morning. I was calm. I managed to finish my next little bit of preparation. And I also added in a few extra tips. I did my neurocycle and then in my active reaches, not only did I do the work that I sat doing three, for three hours last night, and, and woke up this morning calm, etc. But this morning to make sure, and I did a few of these things last night, between last night and this morning, I applied extra little tips. And that's what I'm going to share with you now. So I'm going to share six de-escalation tips that I know are going to help you tremendously. They help me so much. They're so logical. You've heard these all before. So it's not really anything new. But I'm just going to explain a little bit more about them and what they do in your brain and why these should be a part of your lifestyle. I've really disciplined myself to build these tips. I don't do all of them all at once. I'll do a selection. Sometimes I'll do two or three together, whatever works for me in that particular moment. But these are six of my top favorite ones. And I have lots of others too, which I'll share in another podcast. But today I'm going to share my top six tips for de-escalating high emotional states and situations. Okay, so the first one, and I'm going to be looking down. When I look down, it's only because I want to make sure that I hit all the points, as I always say. And okay, so the first one is touch. Touch is so important. And I'm talking about appropriate touch. Michelangelo once said, to touch is to give life. And it is so true. There's so much physiology that happens when you put your hands on someone else because you're pretty much entering into their mind space and you're entering into their gravitational field. Your gravitational fields and electromagnetic fields are touching and that sends waves through the body. And that's why appropriate touch is so incredibly healing and inappropriate touch is so incredibly damaging. But today I'm going to talk about appropriate touch. At another stage, I will talk about the damage that inappropriate touch gives. So there's a lot of studies, so much in the literature about just the emotional and physical healing that touch can bring. You know, experiments, for example, have been done where people have been ill and in hospital and just by a loved one sitting there and holding their hand, they have felt that person, even when they were maybe in a coma or in a very state of, of a state of not actually being able to communicate, but they felt the touch of their loved one and immediately the doctors who change in their neurophysiological responses. So there's a burgeoning field of touch research. I mean, it's a huge field and you can just Google it and you'll find tons of studies. So I've just picked a couple of my favorite ones because this is this is a topic I could talk about for hours upon hours. And I, I recommend you look at the links 
that, that I'm talking about, and we'll have a blog on this as well, and go do your own research. But appropriate touch is absolutely myste- magical and mystical in what it does for the human, the human connection and the human brain and human brain health and bodily health and getting yourself into seeing stress in the right way, making those 1400 neurophysiological responses work for you and not against you. Okay, so there's actually a scientific importance that we need to attach to touch. There's scientific research showing that touch is important. And in fact, you, you, I'm sure you've heard of the studies of, of the sensory deprivation of children that don't get touched and are put into orphanages and how their body weight is affected and how their emotional state is affected. And once they get touched, there, there's a huge improvement in that, um, that feel in terms of them growing and emotional changes, et cetera, et cetera. There's the monkey hug therapy where they took baby monkeys away from their mothers and they just fed them through little bottles, through a little wire cage, in a little wire cage, and they got really sick and their cortisol levels rose. And as soon as they were put back with their mothers, their whole physiology changed and their healing came. So sensory deprivation is a very, very real thing. It affects, uh, it affects emotional development and uh, psychological development and physical development. I mean, even growth, even those, those children that were put in orphanages were smaller, their growth um, was inhibited through the lack of touch. So basically, when we touch, it promotes bonding and attachment and mental well-being and improves physical health. So that's a lot. It improves bonding, mental and physical well-being, and also builds attachment. And there's a lot that we're going to talk about in the future about attachment theories. And attachment, a lot of attachment is coming through the correct kind of touch. It activates, and on a scientific lev- level, it activates the orbitofrontal, orbitofrontal cortex, which is over here which is a very important part for developing, your, for you feeling your identity. It's related to identity. It's related to your value system. It's related to how you feel about yourself. And that's why it's so important that appropriate touch. I mean, just think of it like this, that let's say that you're in a really, like really feeling emotionally distressed and someone just kind of just pats you or just gives you a hug or just says it's going to be okay. That tapping, that touch, sends a vibrational change through your brain and your body helps to release hormones that then calm you down and activates a high level of activity in the orbitofrontal cortex that is basically your a response of your mind moving through your brain because your mind is now telling your brain it's okay I'm okay it's going to be okay I'm not alone even though we don't understand this I'm not alone I, it's okay I, and and your your value system your identity is improved okay so this part of your brain is also linked to feelings of reward and compassion. So when, when you are, have a great conversation, when you succeed in something, when you have any kind of, you know, touching that little cute puppy, there's like a reward system that our reward system is activated in the brain. And that's pretty much our love system in the brain. This desire to connect and to bond and to feel good and to be helping others and all this kind of thing activates the orbitofrontal cortex and it activates the reward system. And it leads to a whole release of a lot of different chemicals like dopamine that helps us focus and oxytocin that increases bonding and serotonin that, in, that improves our mood. And these all work together. Also anandamide, which is known as the bliss molecule. And all these chemicals are working together with the different systems of the brain, kind of with the, front, the orbitofrontal cortex leading the show in helping you to feel it's going to be okay. So that's what good touch does. Okay, so some of the feelings. The scientist who discovered the impact of touch on, and the changes in the orbitofrontal cortex is a scientist called Dr. Edmund Rolls. And very interesting research that he did on how when we are have, do have appropriate touch, we get this, this response in our orbitofrontal cortex that is very positive for the whole system. Because you, remember, you don't work with just one part. It doesn't mean just your orbitofrontal cortex is working. When this is activated in the way by, that it is by touch, it then sends a wave through the entire brain and all the systems of the brain are connected. So it then sends a very positive connective flow through the whole brain and you benefit, the whole brain then benefits and the whole body then benefits. So you get this kind of wave of theta wave moving through your whole brain and affecting, the, giving you a sense of healing and peace through your whole brain and your body. Dr. David Linden Professor of Neuroscience at John Hopkins says, touch communicates, I'm on your side. So touch is communicating, I'm on your side. Dr. Dacher Keltner of Berkeley University, he says, touch is our 
primary language of compassion. So touch, it's not even with words, touch is the primary language of compassion. The way you touch someone, that gentle touch, that gentle embracing hug is the primary way that we actually demonstrate compassion or speak compassion, speak compassion with our hands. It's a primary means of spreading compassion as well. He says that we are better at reading touch than we are at reading facial expression. And we are pretty much 50% of communication is non-verbal. So this is a very, touch is a very strong element of non-verbal communication. And as humans, we are better at reading touch than we are at verbal communication, facial expression. So if you don't know what to say to someone and someone is in a really bad state, just reaching out and touching them. I know that when I was kind of anxious last night and I got into bed and I was saying to my husband, oh, I've got so much to do. And, and Matt just reached and he was half asleep. He was so tired. And he just reached out and he just said, I love you. It's okay. Come here. I'll give you a hug and gave me a hug. And I immediately, honestly, I went from being really quite worked up to totally calm to thinking, hey, I can do this. I can get through this. I experienced that He's on my side. I'm not alone. There he is snoring next to me, fast asleep, and I'm here working. But it was that gentle touch that changed my physiology and enabled me to become very focused. Got my orbital frontal cortex working, got those chemicals flowing, and I was very focused and did three hours of amazing work. So Dacha Keltner says that we are better at reading touch than we are facial expression. He also says the U.S. is touch deprived. And he refers to a study, and I went and looked at these studies, by Dr. Sidney Girard in the 1960s, who looked at friends having a discussion in a cafe in different countries. And I'm just going to quote a few of the results. He said that watching how, how, many, how much friends touch during a conversation. So this is good friends in a great conversation for an hour. In the UK, they touched zero times. In the United States, they touched twice. Okay. In, in France, they touched 110 times. Like the U, UK none, US twice. In France, 110 times there was touch in that conversation. And in Puerto Rico, it was 180 times. So we need to look at how we are not touching enough. And that goes to our society, the Western culture, specifically the U.S., is a very individualistic culture. And the more individualistic we become, the less we use touch in the correct way. Okay, so in a study done by Jim Cohn and Richard Davidson, they, they saw that participants lying in an fMRI brain scanner anticipating a painful blast of white noise showed heightened brain activity in regions associated with threat and stress. So here there was someone lying in an fMRI machine and they were, they were getting these blasts of white noise and they saw the parts of the brain that will get very active when you feel fear in your mind. And they saw those areas increasing in high beta activity. There was too much high beta activity more or less in the area that I'm pointing to. So they were anticipating the pain. But participants whose romantic partner stroked their arm while they were in the fMRI, so they were in the fMRI and the romantic partner was holding their hand, saying it's going to be, they were just, they weren't even talking, they were just stroking their arm, that basically they didn't show that reaction at all. It was the same situation. One group were on their own, showed the fear response, one group had the stroking, that great, beautiful, loving touch, and there was no fear response. And that fear response, if you are in a medical situation, in a physical situation where you need to healing or you're getting tested or whatever, it's so important to stay calm because otherwise when those areas are activated, it influences the entire way that the brain and body is functioning and how, it will, how you will respond to the testing, the medication, etc., etc. Okay, so that's the first tip. So make sure that you fit touch in your life. Mac and I are very touchy. My kids and I are very touchy. When I see people, I make very conscious of giving them a pat, giving them a hug. When, you know, obviously now we're socially distanced, so we have to give, you know, the air hugs. But it's still, you know, it's still that connection. So bring that into your life. And, you know, sometimes you may just want to give yourself a hug. You know, you may be alone and be feeling like you just need touch. And it's called havening, where you just literally do this to yourself, where you're giving yourself this gentle touch. And it's so calming. And there's lots of research on that. It goes straight to the amygdala and calms down the emotional perceptions that the amygdala is so good at storing. So now let's talk about tip number two. Tell someone that you love them and let them know how much they mean to you. So we've moved from touch now to communication. Telling someone, don't assume that someone knows they love you. Tell them. Every night when we go to bed, I tell my kids, I love you. Every time I'm on a, on a call with my kids I, and we end the call, it's love you. When we see each other, it's love you. And we mean it. 
And my husband and I, multiple times a day, we'll say to each other, we'll text it to each other. We've made it a deliberate practice in our whole household. And basically what it does, when you tell someone that you are activating those mirror neurons, and there's a lot of research on mirror neurons, and it's amazing research. And it started back quite a few years ago where they, where they saw how with monkeys, when you picked up a teacup, they picked up a teacup. Their monkeys watching a person pick up a teacup, the same areas were activated as the person picking up the teacup. People watching someone play tennis, the same areas are activated in the brain. So our mirror neuron system, we're learning more and more about, but it in, basically enables us to connect with each other. It's a connection a response. So they mirror each other's emotions in order to bring us closer, to tune into each other, to increase empathy. Absolutely marvelous neurons that we have in our brain. And we're learning more and more and more about them. So when you tell someone that you love them and you mean it, and it comes through with your, your hands and your facial expression and your eyes, and that's generating actual photons of love, beautiful love waves from you to that person they're receiving that, that is tremendously healing in the person giving it as well as the person receiving it. So therefore, when you're feeling like you need to de-escalate, because we are talking about de-escalating high-level emotion, but you see someone's highly worked up, just going up to them, touching them and say, hey, I love you. Those two tips combined are going to really help to de-escalate the situation. And you know that person, so you know how to say it. You can work out your own language, your own way of saying it, but saying it is so important. So it activates the mirror neurons. Words stimulate auditory cues of safety and reward. So when you say, I love you, it's, hey, you feel I am needed. I, I'm needed. It's, I care so much for you. I'm needed. I want you to be to feel safe. I don't want you to feel de-escalated. Hey, I love you. You are needed. That's what it's also communicating. And this will calm the neurochemical chaos from the high level of emotional activation from whatever the situation was. And that's what my husband did last night when he gave me that hug and touch and he said, I love you. I felt that. I felt I'm needed. It calmed my neurochemical chaos and so on. It also triggers dopamine. When you hear that, it triggers dopamine, which helps you to focus. And it helps. And it also, it's, it's like a reward. It's like an incentive. It's like a bonus. That, hey, it's, that, that, it's that incentive to, to say, okay, it's going to be okay. I, I'm not alone. There's, there, there's someone there for me. It's like this bonus. I'm not alone. There's an incentive to keep pushing through because you're not doing this alone. You need it. It also, in, that increases gamma across the brain. And gamma is a, a very high frequency wave. And when that flows across the brain, across both sides, you get very creative. So therefore, when you get very creative, you start solving your problems. So the thing that's making you, de you know, escalate, you've got now more brain power to de-escalate. So that's what I love you can help to increase gamma to help de-escalate. Okay, it activates the vagus nerve, which is very, vagus nerve, which runs through like your, like literally your whole body. And that fires up the brain and the body and gives it, and, and gives you a holistic experience. So the fact that I love you is felt literally through your whole body is also can be attributed to the activation of the vagus nerve. So all these great things are happening. Oxytocin is released and oxytocin, as we know, is the bonding chemical. And when that's released, you feel bonded. These are all things that go towards brain and body health and longevity and increased intelligence and wisdom and cognitive flexibility. All the things that we lose when we are emotionally in an escalated situation. So these are all ways to de-escalate, okay? So we want more oxytocin, we want more dopamine, we want the vagus nerve activated in that very calming way, etc. okay? The ACG, which is anterior central gyrus, which is in the middle of the brain, fires up and it's very, it's very much when you self-reflect and you're aware of your emotional state. When that fires up, it's giving you a sense of control. And so de-escalation, you feel out of control. So when someone says, I love you, it fi you're, you're, you start feeling a little bit more in control, which then fires up your ACG. And then this feedback loop is set up that starts helping you to start getting the control back. And that's exactly what I was feeling when I was going through this last night. Okay. And it also lowers cortisol, which you want because cortisol is fantastic, but not when it's in high levels. You want it in the right ratio with DHEA. And telling someone that you love them will lower that cortisol down which also high cortisol can block thinking because it increases inflammation. Okay, so now the third thing, which relates to how we started this podcast, when we saw my dog, my little puppy Simba, and we have another one too called Nala, is pet or stroke a dog or cat. And a puppy, the pet's presence, now there's tons of stuff on this and tons of research. I'm just going to touch on a few things. I know you know that, and I know everyone knows that, but here's a little bit of science, okay? 
So, I mean, I just love going to play with my puppies. The minute that we are worked up and stressed out, just go and play with those little puppies or just see their little happy joy and licking your face and jumping all over you and playing with them. You feel fantastic. So why do you feel fantastic? Well, there's the touch aspect that, that is stimulating all those responses that I already spoke about, reducing neurochemical chaos, increasing theta, increasing the bonding chemical, etc. All of those are starting to flow. And when those flow, immediate de-escalation happens. A couple of other things. A pet's presence lowers blood pressure. So scientific studies have shown that just a pet's presence will lower blood pressure. When you're in a high emotional state, your blood pressure does escalate because your heart is beating faster because your capillaries around your heart, the vessels around your heart and arteries and capillaries around your heart contract. And when they contract, your heart has to beat faster. And to try and, and there's less blood flow in your brain, which reduces oxygen and blood flow and concentration, and you get this negative response. So your blood pressure increases, and that creates this whole negative response in the brain. But when you, in the presence of a pet, your heart goes back to a normal beat and a normal rhythm, and the, the capillaries start dilating, and your blood pressure normalizes, and you get more blood flow into your brain. I mean, just being in the presence, but just hugging someone just now would have done that to me as well. Okay. And it, which there's so many studies showing like scientific studies showing how patting animals and having animals as support dogs, etc., relieves depression and anxiety, moderates stress in the elderly. You, we've heard of taking horses into hospitals. I mean, this is pure science. It totally transforms the way that the 1,400 neurophysiological responses in our body that work against us if we are in a high emotional state. They, when we have a pet, it de-escalates those and it starts putting us into much healthier state. The impact on the brain, it activates the anterior central gyrus, which I spoke about earlier on with the touch, with the saying I love you and the touch. So it it's then sends this coordinated response to the brain and the body that, hey, it's okay. So the ACG responds. Remember the first we experience the touch or the love, the pet, etc. And as we're stroking that pet, that then is a mind response. Oh, I love this. I'm so happy. It makes me feel good. And then it starts activating the ACG, which then creates this coordinated response to the brain and the body where, it's, where, you, where you start to increase the, the correct kind of waves start flowing through that area of the brain. And the activities, the ex oxygen blood flow and the energy waves are, the, are at this beautiful balanced state, which then enables you to feel more functional and more de-escalated. You don't want your ACG stuck. You want your ACG very fluid. And touching a pet gets your ACG very fluid and gets you out of that sort of OCD type state where you get stuck. When we hug the dog, the sensations stimulate positive feelings across the central gyrus, the amygdala. The amygdala is like a perceptual library. I mean, it's across the whole brain, but I'm just going to pick on a few specific things. So the anterior central gyrus I've spoken about, we want fluidity there. So the sensations of touching Simba a few moments ago would have given me more fluidity in my ACG. It also would have calmed down my amygdala and made sure that my amygdala is not because amygdala is a perceptual library and you've got all these library books of your perceptions of events and if it, if you're in a high emotional state all you're reading in your library books are stories narratives of this is terrible this is bad i can't do this but it changes by touching that dog it's oh okay i won't read that book i'll read that book which i don't know how i'm going to do this but somehow i'll get through this you know so that's what happens in your amygdala and then this reduces toxic stress, it lowers your heart rate, it reduces your blood pressure, it brings surges of dopamine and serotonin. I mean, you just smile. You talk, like this morning my husband said to me, stop talking so much baby language to the dogs because I was playing with them and talking to them and working them up and calming my, and calming my, because I came down in a rush and then played with the dogs and suddenly I was, wasn't in a rush anymore and I'm talking all this baby language and, and surges of dopamine and I was focused and serotonin, I felt calm and happy and Anandamide, the bliss molecule. So it is amazing how this all works. So that's just a couple of things about dogs. Now, tip number four, soak in a hot tub, a jacuzzi, take a long hot shower or bath, a sauna, drink some hot tea and coffee. So one of my favorite things I do at the end of the day is I have a sauna. I have an infrared sauna. Not everyone maybe has that, but maybe at your gym you have. And that heat of the sauna does so many things. When, you're, when your body is immersed in heat, whether it is an infrared sauna or a normal sauna, or you immerse yourself in a, in a hot bath or a jacuzzi, or let, stand in that hot shower, the heat and that gentle, that water, that heat flowing over you just calms your body down. The thermoregulation that's happening, that heat, it's basically dilating blood vessels, it's in, increasing, it's reducing blood pressure, good for cardiovascular health, 
It's increasing blood flow to the throughout the whole body. It's detoxing the body, taking out toxins. It's kind of breaking up. It's getting fluidity through the brain and the body. It's helping the delta, theta, alpha, beta, gamma, all the different energy waves of the brain are, are kind of flowing in a more coherent way like they do in the beach. You're getting, you're getting more coherence between the two sides of your brain. And if you are, let's say, in that hot bath and you're drinking, I love to have like a, a, a sort of hot collagen drink or cocoa or something, chocolate collagen drink, cocoa or something like that. So I have a hot bath with my hot drink after my hot sauna. I tell you, I am so relaxed by the time I go to bed. And sometimes in during the middle of the day, I may have a gap where I don't have to have makeup on and get back in front of a camera and I'm feeling highly like I need to de-escalate. I will go get in the sauna with a hot cup of tea. And that heat does this regulation of, of the set of the highly escalated state. So where things, where my orbital frontal cortex is telling me that, that I feel threatened, where the, the threat system, my amygdala is now saying, taking off the wrong library books off the, off the shelf, where I've got a bit of neurochemical chaos, where chemicals are not flowing in the right proportions, where I can feel my heart beating, my HPA axis, adrenaline shots, r- rushes, not having good clarity of thought. I can feel, which, which is called alpha asymmetry. We're going to get some alpha asymmetry, so my ability to introspect is not going to be very good. When when I get into that state, which is what happens when we are in a high emotional state, that's not good for me. So the hot tub, the hot drink, the hot sauna, those kind of things will help to calm all of that down. So basically, the heat relaxes muscles, improves circulation, stimulates the release of endorphins, which help with pain. Okay, so the pain in your body. I mean, I always find when I, my body's sore after a workout or something, I getting in the sauna just like eases that pain out of my body as well. It, it releases activates the endocannabinoid system in the in the brain as well, which also helps with pain control, lowers cortisol, improves immune function, getting rid of those toxic to- toxic toxic things in your body. Re- lots of studies showing how heat will help because of all of that. Then you feel more in control. So this the warning signals of anxiety and depression, etc., will start lowering. It increases. BDNF, which is a, a very important hormone for neuroplasticity. So we are always changing our brain and growing our brain. But when we calm, we grow, we grow the, 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 the neurons and the little dendrites that we're growing in our brain, as which we are, we need BDNF to convert our experiences of life into these thought trees inside of our brain, the thought trees that you always see me talking about. So we need lots of BDNF. So we, we, we can also use BDN, BDNF in the wrong way to build toxic thoughts. So when we are in an escalated state, we're going to use BDNF to, to increase escalation. So by calming ourselves down, we get increased BDNF to now de- to deconstruct this and build it into the healthy thought to get us to reconceptualize. So the heat will help us move into a more healthy reconceptualized state. So you can hear all these tips are great. If you're using the neurocycle and you get kind of highly worked up or stressed out, from certain, and that can totally happen. I say this in my book, it gets worse before it gets better. These six tips are amazing active reaches to help you de-escalate in a session or after a session or between sessions when things are being brought up that you need to, to deal with. Okay, and, and I'm talking about my neurocycle, by the way. It's That's in my latest book, Cleaning Up Your Mental Mess. And the neurocycle is the five-step scientific process I've developed over the last 38 years in a therapeutic sense and applied it in multiple different situations and I've simplified it and it's in this book. So it's five steps for how you manage your mind and your mind never stops, okay? So hot bars also reduce inflammation, calm the nervous system, the heart beats faster and the pressure of the... Okay, this is it. so interesting. So it also, the heart beats a little bit faster but in a good way which increases blood flow around your body. You know when you're in a hot environment your heart does beat a little faster because the blood vessels are dilating and there's more blood flowing which is how toxins are removed and you get more increased oxygen and blood flow to your brain, etc. So when you're in the heat of the bath or the sauna, your heart's beating faster, doing that good stuff. Then the water pressure of you in a bath is putting pressure on your lungs, which then is also great for increasing lung capacity. So the heat will increase your lung capacity, getting more oxygen through your body, which is ex- wonderful because you take deep breaths. So you can also do like deep breathing exercises, like I often do the Wim Hof deep breathing method or my 10 second pause while I'm in the bath especially when I first just sink in that hot bubble bath, <sighs> I do some deep breathing, let the water pressure press on my lungs, get the oxygen flowing through my brain, a few deep deep breathing exercises, have my hot drink, maybe have a little movie playing with some music or something like that. Incredible ways of de-escalating. 
So it also balances hormones like ACTH, which is related to the stress system. So when you, it sends a message down to your, to, the, to your kidneys, to your adrenal glands on your kidneys, and then back up to your brain. And when ACTH is flowing too high, it keeps you stuck. So you want your ACTH flowing at the right levels so that you don't get stuck, that you have cycles of tension and release as you're working through something. So the heat also helps to balance things like ACTH. So many great things. Okay, tip number five, prepare and share a meal with others. Now, I mean, I know you know this, but there's so many great things. Reciprocity, bonding, deep meaning, fun, connection. It's so good when you do all of these because it stimulates the kind of brain-mind workout to keep your brain healthy. If you want a really fantastic brain-mind workout that you can do two to three times a day, it's preparing and sharing a meal together. It's a wonderful mind-brain workout that is totally healing, builds resilience, calms down neurochemicals, all those chemicals I've been talking about, the amygdala, the the, it, it also activates the hippocampus, so it gives you a memory workout. It, it helps to coordinate and create a lot of system interaction in the different systems of your brain, which is wonderful, with your body, because of the whole bonding aspect where you're talking and sharing and preparing together. That bonding aspect, how, is there's a whole physics thing happening there where you've got a lot of photons moving back and forth between you and the other person or persons, and that's enhancing the waves around your body, which are the waves of your mind. And that's good because we designed for enhancement, not competition. So if you think of two waves in the sea, when they hit each other and they build on each other, they get, so when they get under each other, so they come and they get under each other, they build, that's enhancement. Uh, she preparing and sharing a meal enhances our emotional state because it enhances our mind waves instead of canceling them. Because when two waves, don't, two waves can cancel each other or they can build. So the bonding and sharing over a meal builds the waves. It doesn't cancel, okay? So that's really great. There's Dr. Jeffrey Cummings from Cleveland Clinic. He talks about sharing and preparing a meal together is based on three pillars of brain health. The familiar activity of cooking exercises the brain. So you want to keep exercising your brain. I talk a lot about brain building in my book and exercising your brain. And so preparing and sharing a meal is a great way of actually exercising your brain. So that's one thing, it's exercise for your brain that is really healthy. Okay, the other pillar is it obviously nourishes our brain and our body. So not just the food, but the connection. You're getting all kinds of nourishing chemicals and chemical reactions and electrochemical reactions happening through your brain and your body from this bonding and connection. And the third thing is it prom the third pillar that Dr. Cummings talks about is it promotes social connectedness, which is what we design for. As you, we all talk about all the time, we know the problems of isolation. We know we design for deep, meaningful connection and social connectedness. We know that when we do that, our whole resilience in our brain and our body change. We move, we wired for love, and social connectedness activates the wired for love design of the neurobiology, and it activates the optimism bias in the mind and in the waves of the mind, which then sends this wonderful reaction through the brain and the body, which increases theta, which is a healing wave, and gamma, which is that way that helps us to solve problems and really think deeply about things, and increases alpha, which helps us to introspect, and so on. And it drops down high beta, which can make us anxious and keeps high beta at the right level. So it just does the most fantastic stuff. And then also it helps you like just do like little special things, like you can draw on, work on your memory. Like when you're cooking for a family, Maybe someone eats this and someone doesn't eat that, or you know it's someone's favorite meal. Just recently, all my kids were together for my youngest daughter's birthday, and one flew in from Seattle, and and, and we had my son in Dallas, and so we, you know all of all four of us were together, and the husbands, and it was just such a special time. And I don't cook much anymore because I'm so busy, and because my kids cook better than I do. But I made one of my family's favorite meals, and I make this amazing chicken ala king, and I my kids absolutely love that. So it was such a special thing that I chose that night to cook, which I'd very seldom do, and cook my kids' favorite families and kids' favorite meal. And we cooked that and there was just the preparation together and the, the memories and just focusing on I did it for them and the whole beautiful bonding thing. It, all of us were benefiting so much mentally and physically in the brain ways that I've been describing. My youngest daughter loves to cook and I can't eat garlic. And I have a terrible reaction. So she is so lovingly when she prepares a meal she always prepares the same meal, but separate for me without garlic. And then she's worked on all this combination of different ways of using herbs and spices. So it's just as tasty as if you would use it with garlic. But I don't have to suffer the consequences I do if I eat garlic. I mean, that's the kind of 
loving connectedness that is built through preparing and sharing together. The, it also impacts the brain, the waves, as I said, the hormones. Your hormones also start balancing. It influences the endocrine system, so you get balance in your hormones. And I'm not just talking about from the food nutritional aspect. I'm talking about the bonding aspect of preparing and sharing together. You also have that wonderful impact in your ACG that I spoke about earlier on, where you get this cognitive fluid, fluid, fluidity. So if you're feeling like stuck in a bad place, by cooking and preparing the meal and sitting together and having the meal, you can break that. You can get out of that stuck that, that depression or anxiety or stuck in that bad place. It breaks that. It helps to break those like clogged up bits that are keeping you emotionally stuck, which we see a lot more fluidity and activity around the ACG area in the brain when you're cooking and sharing and breaking down those, those clogged up places from emotional stuckness. And it also activates executive functions, which are the functions we talk about happening in the front part of the brain or uh, that, are, that the front part of the brain responds to that. So the executive functions are essentially things like problem solving and planning and goal-directed activity and fun and organizational skills and memory retrieval. So you're activating that part of the brain to really focus on that. So whatever you do after that, you've got your PFC in a really great state. So it's a mind activity having all of these wonderful brain body benefits. And then finally, Point tip number six, help someone, help someone. Helping someone is so good for brain health, for de-escalating an emotional state. And in fact, there's a study, PubMed released a study that, it, that when you help someone, it reduces mortality by 30%. So this can be anything. It can be you give someone your time, a physical gift, a donation, sitting and talking to them, sitting and just listening to them. But when you reach out and help someone, especially when you're in a bad state, you improve your own healing by, by a massive factor and you reduce your mortality. So it's the helping someone else that totally transforms your entire neurophysiology, that it reduces your mortality by 30%. I mean, if that doesn't want to motivate you to de-escalate your emotions and increase because high emotional states, staying in those high states increases mortality. So if you want to reduce, de-escalate very quickly out of that, you help by helping someone, that's what you are doing. So just to to end off this particular tip, we, I'm just going to read you from the study, the American, uh, the American Journal of Public Health in 2013, said that data from, from previous studies indicate that help given to others is a better predictor of health and well-being and are indicators of social engagement or receive social support. So that means that giving to others actually helps your de-escalation of emotions and your neurophysiology better than actually getting help. So giving help helps more than getting help, which is incredible. So with that, we'll, I'm going to end there. I hope these six tips will really help you de-escalate high emotional states. Quick summary, the six tips are touch, telling someone that you love them, Petting a dog, stroking a cat, soaking in a hot tub, jacuzzi, taking a long hot shower, sauna, hot tea, coffee, that kind of thing, preparing and sharing a meal with others and helping someone. Hope this has helped you and I'll see you all next week.